to you about Isaiah. <coughs> How many are liking the book of Isaiah? Chapter 6 is my all-time favorite chapter of the book of Isaiah. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you this. I'm preaching in, uh, I'm preaching in uh, the Healing Place on June 9th and June 23rd or 30th. June 9th, and I think it's June 30th. I'll announce it as it comes. Then also in July. But I may take what I'm going to teach you tonight and actually spit it into a, into a message. It's so powerful. Now tonight I'm going to teach it. Uh, June, I may preach it. Uh, it's not going to be the same thing. It's going to be a lot of a lot of the same context, but it, context. But there's so much there uh, because it's very, very. It's one of my favorite parts. So after giving us five chapters of God's God's uh, impending judgment and uh, for Judah and Jerusalem uh, because of their complacency and their corruption, Isaiah now goes back and tells us exactly how we received this call from God. So Isaiah chapter six is him actually going backwards and telling us how God called him. It's really sobering. Uh, Isaiah uh, goes back. And Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, kind of tells it, sets it up for you. It says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, we're going to talk about that, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a, a throne, high and lifted up, and his train, the train of his robe, filled the temple. So, uh, and we know the exact year that King Uzziah died. We know it from lots of different sources. It's not contested. It was exactly 740 B.C. We actually know quite a lot about King Uzziah. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king of Judah. 16. Um, in 2 Chronicles 26, 1, it tells us that. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and they made him king in the room of his father, Amaziah. Amaziah was also a king. So the first 24 years of his reign, until he was 40 years old, were as co-regent with his father, Amaziah. And he, re he reigned for a total of 52 years. So we actually know he died here at the age of 68. So we know when he was born, we know when he died. We know how old he was. We know how much he reigned. In the early part of his reign, he was faithful to God. He was one of the good kings to God. And uh, scripture tells us that. It tells us in 2 Chronicles. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's always, you'll see that for good kings. According to all that his father Amaziah did. His father was also a godly king. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, another prophet. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. So that's a really key verse right there. In Jerusalem, he did a couple things. <coughs> Excuse me. He made machines designed by skillful men for the use on towers, which he built on the city walls. So he reinforced the walls of Jerusalem. He built towers on it, and he made machines on those towers that would shoot, that would shoot arrows, multiple arrows, large arrows, and would, have, would, uh, shoot large, would push out uh, and throw out large stones. So here's what it says. It says, uh, Jerusalem, moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, and at the valley gate, and at the turning of the wall, and fortified them. He also built towers in the desert. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men and went out to war by bands. And under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,000, 307,500, that made war with a mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and habergeons and bows and slings to cast stones. Now, you really need to take, pay attention to that. When I read that, most people read right over that. He built these. They're called trebuchets, catapults. They would take a stone with a counterweight and they would take it up and they would sling it. The reason why that's so important to me is that he did this in 740 BC. The art was lost. It comes back in the Middle Ages. They don't have catapults or trebuchets until about 1500. So he's almost a thousand years before his time building something that was not duplicated. I don't know if anybody else could have done that. This was a weapon of mass destruction. It could take fire, it could take stones, it could take large boulders that had, that had straw around them that are on fire, and it would destroy the enemy. He reigned supreme in Jerusalem. Nobody ever beat him because he had a weapon of mass destruction. It was a thousand years later, almost, 800, 900, that really men of the Middle Ages started to use it, especially in France, that's this French word, trebuchet. And so the Bible tells us a whole lot about him. According to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, he conquered the Philistines, the Arabians, and the Ammonites. Matter of fact, the Ammonites were very fearful of him. And the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad even to the entering in of G Egypt. He strengthened himself exceedingly. So he was someone who secured all of Jer Jerusalem. God prospered him. Jerusalem was never defeated in his reign. There were enemy armies all over the place. But he was very, very skilled, had skilled artisans that built the trebuchets. But his pride left to his, led to his downfall. It always does. Trying to take the place of the priests 
which, uh, which was highly forbidden all over scripture. There were kings, there were prophets, and there were priests. You never went past those lines. If a king tried to become a priest and offer sacrifice, God would strike him down. We know that, uh, that uh, King Saul tried to, uh, tried to offer sacrifice. He lost the kingdom from it. Uh, basically killed Agag. Listen, we, we see it over and over again. Well, Uzziah became so powerful and so prideful that he thought he could offer incense on the altar of incense to God. Highly forbidden in scripture. And so basically, he goes to the temple and he offers incense on the altar. Uh, that's Uzziah there with the censer. So he offers incense on the altar. The Bible tells us a great earthquake shook the ground and the temple split open and the, and the bright rays of the sun shone through it and fell on, fell on the king's face insomuch that leprosy seized upon him immediately, according to historian Josephus. So that's uh, Rembrandt's picture of the leprous King Uzziah. So he became, he became prideful. He did something that uh, he should never have done. Uh, and he was driven from the temple and compelled to live in a separate house until his death. 2 Kings 15.5 tells us that. <coughs> and the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. That word several house, by the way, means it's a term for living by yourself. And Jotham, the king's son, was over his, the house, judging the people of the land. So he lost this kingship even because of his, of his uh, leprosy. In 1931... Uzziah's gravestone was found on the Mount of Olives. <coughs> Excuse me. Pretty interesting. Here's what it says. It says, Hither was brought the bones of Uzziah, not to be opened forever. Uh, we've never found his bones, but we did find his gravestone. So now watch. Without him, we would not have had someone called Jesus. He's directly in his lineage. There he is. Jehoshaphat, Joram, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz. So Uzziah is a very, very important person. Especially in, in Isaiah's mind, Uzziah was someone who knew that God had stricken him. He had left the kingdom. So obviously we think that he probably uh, recommitted himself to God, stayed in a separate house and gave his, gave his kingship to Josiah, who was also a good king. So Uzziah got out right when he knew he did something wrong. Now watch. It's a lot for tonight, isn't it? Isn't that a lot for tonight? So let's just go home. That's it. No, no. Wait, there's more. Uzziah's death rocked Isaiah's world. It's actually the catalyst for his calling. It's the reason why he got called. Chapter 6 can be broken down into four main points. Confronted by God, convicted of sin, cleansed by fire, and commissioned to faithfulness. So let's go to the first point. Confronted by God. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. Seraphim have six wings. Cherubim have four wings. With twain or two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's an antiphonal uh, response. It's a, it's a song. The Gregorian chant back and forth. Each one of them is crying out. And the posts of the door were moved uh, at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. A powerful vision. Here it is. I, I don't know if any man can do it justice. But Isaiah has this massive vision. He first sees the sovereignty of God. All of Israel needed to be shaken by this vision of the Lord, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. His train of his robe fills the temple. Yes, there is a temple in heaven. Revelation 19 says it. The uh, temple that's built in Jerusalem is a copy of the temple that's in heaven. Each of these symbols, the title, the Lord, the throne, the lofty position, uh, and uh, the all-encompassing robe, reinforced his sovereignty over all the universe, over all of its kings, over all of its rulers, over all of their nations, over all people, including the chosen people of Israel. Man, how I wish our world could get a vision and a glimpse of who God really is. God is sovereign. It means that he's over everything. No matter who thinks they have rule or reign, God is over it all. How I wish the church in America could get a glimpse of who God really is. Look, Satan knows God is sovereign, which means he's over all. <laughs> Excuse me, how do I know that? How do I know that Satan knows? Because he tried to usurp that, that title in Nazi Germany. There was, a, there was a slogan in Nazi Germany, Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. It's Germany, Germany overall. What Hitler was trying to say was that Germany was sovereign. It was going to be sovereign over the entire world. It was going to rule everything. Everything was going to come through it. So we know that. It never did and it never will. Nothing ever will. Only God is sovereign. Only God is overall. And here's what it means for us tonight. Tonight it means this. I, I always trust in the sovereignty of God. Acknowledge that God's in control. He's in control of your life. 
He's in control of my life. He's in control of politics. He's in control of nations. He's in control of wars. He's in control of the economy. He knows exactly what's going on. If anything goes downward, he's allowing it to happen. He is sovereign over every single thing. Ask God to transform you into the image of Christ. We need a vision of God. We need, and the church desperately needs a vision of God. We need to see who God is. Ask God to glorify himself. Embrace that this world is not our home. Pray like Jesus. Your will be done. When we get a vision of God, when you really understand the vision of God, that's really when you get salvation. I want you to know that. That's really when you come to the knowledge of realizing that who you are in God and who he is in the universe. So uh, Isaiah also extols his holiness when he tells us this, that the uh, seraphim sing an antiphonal choruses back and forth. Holy, holy, holy. Back and forth they do that. Six, six winged ser seraphim. I'll show you those in a moment. No other attribute of God is so praised. Angels don't sing love, love, love. They don't sing justice, justice, justice. They sing holy, holy, holy. Sixth wing cherubim. They're seraphim, excuse me. Cover their face with two wings, cover their feet with two wings, and flew with two wings. The, the seraphim are an amazing, are an amazing uh, creature of God. Why? Because even without sin, and they have no sin, they, these are ones that didn't fall, even without sin, they can't stand to have the holy God look upon their created nature. He also, and he alone, excuse me, he alone is holy. Then Isaiah tells us they sing, the whole earth is full of his glory. That's what they're singing. <laughs> holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Think about that. That means this place is full of his glory. That means uh, North Korea is full of his glory. It means China is full of his glory. It means that Russia is full of his glory. Now just listen to what I'm saying. It's a different Hebrew word that normally refers to glory. The normal word for glory is to shine forth. It's, this word is the word kabod in the Hebrew. And it means it's his weight, his overwhelming presence. Wow, how do people miss him today? How do people miss God today? All you have to do is go out and look outside in a sunset and see his overwhelming presence. He's everywhere. And people miss him over and over. Verse tells, or 4 tells us that the temple in heaven can hardly stay standing while God's in it. The, the posts of the doors are shaking. The house is filled with smoke. So let me ask you a question. Put yourself in Isaiah's place right now, seeing what he saw. How would you respond to seeing the Lord high and lifted up? <coughs> Excuse me, what would you do? How would you respond? If you saw that vision, what would happen with you? Fall down? Let me tell you what, what Isaiah does. Here it is, second part. He gets convicted of his sin. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. This is because of the vision. I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The NIV says it this way. Uh, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It's quite an obvious outcome of being confronted with the Holy God. We should feel the anguish of our own sin. We should feel the anguish of our own greed, our selfishness, our lack of morals, our faults that cause us to place God on the back burner when we place ourselves on the front burner. The KJV puts it this way. Woe is me, I'm undone. The New Revised Standard Version says, Woe is me, I am lost. Still another version says this. Horrors of horrors, my doom is sealed. Here's the fundamental truth. Whenever we see the King, the Lord of hosts, our sinfulness is exposed. The closer you move to an object, the closer you move an object to a light source, the more flaws are noticed in that object. And repeat it. <laughs> it's a great statement. The closer you move an object to a light source, the more flaws are noticed in that object. You know, I hear people telling me all the time, and not just me, but I hear people saying it in media and every place that God has showed up to them or they had a vision of God. And then almost, they almost go on to tell you how great they are. If you have a vision of God, you're going to feel like a worm. You're going to feel horrible. You're going to feel like, how can I even stand in front of him? That is the vision of God that we should have. Sometimes... Um, sometime read the, the conversions of some of the great men of God from the Apostle Paul to Charles Colson to St. Augustine to John Calvin to John Bun uh, Bunyan to Wesley to Spurgeon Tolstoy William Booth and the Salvation Army C.S. Lewis and others and you will find out one common theme is in their conversion there is agony in their souls the stab of consciousness the shame of invalid uh, of inward uncleanness the, the remorse for sin the sensation of being lost and alone when John Bunyan, <coughs> excuse me, when John Bunyan got a glimpse of the holiness of God, he said he felt like a child falling into a well, sprawled out in the water. At the bottom of the well of the pit, he could find no handhold or foothold to lift him out. He felt he would die in that condition. From that memory came the allegory he wrote called Pilgrim's Progress. Isaiah felt that way. Look, truth is, our spiritual sensitivity to sin is dulled 
when we've lost sight of a holy God. Actually, that's a quote from me. Our spiritual sensitivity to sin is dulled when we lose sight of a holy God. How can someone continue? How can somebody in a pulpit continue to go out and sin horribly? And uh, whether people know it or not, how could they do that? It's because they've lost sight of God. You can't blatantly sin and do anything you want to do if you if you have a vision of God in your mind. How many are with me? The closer you are to God, the more you're going to be convicted of your sin. Does that make sense to you? So when I see somebody who's who reaches the, who hits the papers and says evangelist falls, I think this. That guy has not have a sight of God anymore. The holiness of God is not in his head anymore. He may understand Christianity, but somewhere down the line he lost that vision of God. And, and that's good. Let me, let me repeat it one more time. Our spiritual sensitivity to sin is dulled when we lose sight of a holy God. How do you lose sight of a holy God? Think about your world. Think about your problems. Think about yourself. Think about your kids. Think about everything else running around you and don't think about God and you lose sight of them real quick. How many are with me tonight? <laughs> Why do you think so much sin is, is prevalent today? Many have lost sight of their holiness of God. Another agonizing truth comes into, into focus in Isaiah's response. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah is not shifting blame here. In short, he's saying that he has no place in the presence of God. He has no right to praise God. And he has no authority to speak for God. That's what he's saying. I have no right. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that I don't have a right to be, I, I, feel, hor I feel horrible about myself? Have you ever felt that way? We all have. Isaiah has been pronouncing woes for five chapters on sinners of Judah and Jerusalem. He's been telling them about their rebellion and their woes and, and, the, and the sins and the woes that are coming to them for five chapters before we got here. But upon seeing his, the vision of God, he now asks, how can I speak for God without a heart like God's? How can I do that? Who am I that I can do that? Thank you. For it. Thank you. So he's questioning himself. Anyone would if they see that presence of God, that holiness of God. Jesus told us if there is sin in our hearts, it'll defile us. It says, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. He's saying, how can I go and speak for God? He's been already doing it for five chapters, probably, or maybe this is the beginning of it, we don't know, but he's saying, how can I go and speak for him? I'm defiled, I'm a sinner, my mouth, my, my, I'm unclean. How can I have unclean lips? How can I go speak for God? It's pretty powerful. Also from Isaiah's confession, we learn that sin has another dimension. After confessing his own sin, Isaiah goes on to say this, Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He is saying that sin is universal. The Pope is a miserable sinner. Somebody say amen. Paul was a miserable sinner. He said he was the chiefest sinner. Billy Graham was a miserable sinner. Listen, Mother Teresa was a sinner. I want you to know, you and I are sinners. It's the truth of Scripture. The pervasiveness of sin is frightening. Statistics tell us that 90% of the, of the perpetrators of domestic violence and sexual abuse learned the behavior as either victims or witnesses of violence or abuse. Sin is contagious. It's innate in us. It's reinforced by the world. And now sin is accepted by the church in our today's world. And minim minimized by preachers and winked at by theologians. And so we are all people who are not admitting, not us, but we're people who are not admitting that we're sinners. We're starting to agree that you can bring sin into the church. It doesn't matter. We've lost the sight of a holy God. Man, can you see how I can get excited if I preach this? <coughs> so why all the emphasis by Isaiah on sin? Why not just move on to his anointing? He's one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, if not the, if not the greatest. The answer is, in the first century biblical qualifications for prophetic or apostolic ministry, in the early church, it required two qualities for ordination in the ministry. Number one, one quality was to be blameless in character. And the other one was to be true to the word of God. Later on, as the church drifted from its biblical moorings into institutional corruption, now anyone can be ordained if they go through the denominational checklist. So if you want to be a pastor today, all you've got to do is get your denomination to tell you the checklist. You don't have to, you don't have to describe to the two main things which is to have a great character and to love the Word of God. That's the only two requirements in the first century church. So the result today, you have corrupt popes, you have abusive priests, you have preachers and pastors who are a cancer upon the history of the church because they don't have the qualifications, which also leads to the third part, cleansed by fire. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me having a live coal in his hand. By the way, there's an altar in front of the throne of God with live coals in it. Hell was created by it, Ezekiel tells us. A live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs off the altar. 
and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. So Isaiah admits he's a sinner, but basically what he's saying is, okay, I can't, I can't understand because I'm a sinner. How in the world can I do it? Well, a live coal comes off the altar, cleansed by fire. Um, let me show it to you. Uh, I'm stuck here. No, oh, give it to me. Uh-oh. Hang on here. Ah, there we go. So a live coal from off the altar, and he touches his lips. So it's the image of that coal and fire being placed on Isaiah's lips. There is a more uncomfortable truth for modern-day Christians. It's another uncomfortable truth. Here it is. If our spiritual cleansing is partial, then our spiritual consecration is dull, and our spiritual commitment is shaky. God has one word for all of us in Isaiah's vision, fire. It's the fire that purifies us. It's the fire that ignites us. Blaise Pascal used this word to describe his life-changing encounter with God in 1654. In bold capital letters, he wrote in his journal on Monday, November 23rd, 1654, quote, in bold capital letters, he wrote the word fire, F-I-R-E. So what happened to him on that night? Well, let me share it with you. Blaise Pascal was one of the most important scholars of the 17th century. He was a great scientist, mathematician, and inventor. By the way, you wouldn't have a calculator today without him. Famous for many key breakthroughs, he was also a devoted Catholic and wrote what is considered to be one of the best apologetic works of his time. But he wasn't always a believer. As a matter of fact, he didn't care much about God at all. He was born Catholic, didn't really care about the church or anything. After spending most of his life only nominally interested in religion, he had a dramatic conversion and it was due to an incredible and dramatic mystical experience. The year was 1654, Monday, 23rd of November, Feast of St. Clement. Pope and martyr and others in the mart martyrology, vigil of St. Uh, Chris Lugonis, martyr and others, from about half past ten at night, he's writing in his journal, till about half past midnight for two hours, he writes this, fire. And by the way, in his journal, it's huge. And he writes this, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and of the learned, certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God, your God will be my God, forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God. He is only found by the ways taught in the gospel, grandeur of the human soul, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, joy, 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 tears of joy. I have departed from him, they have forsaken me, the fount of living water. My God, will you leave me? Let me not be separated from him forever. This is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, the one that you, that you sent, Jesus Christ. He goes on to say this. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, I left him, I fled him, renounced, crucified, let me never be separated from him. He is only kept securely by the ways taught in the gospel. Renunciation, -renunci total and sweet, complete submission to Jesus Christ and to my director. I eternally enjoy for a day's exercise on the earth. May I not forget your words, amen. Now listen, he was secular when he had this vision of, of Jesus and he had a vision of fire and he wrote it down. For two hours, he spent, and it totally changed his life. No one witnessed to him. Listen. Wow. Whatever he saw, it sounds absolutely amazing. He saw something that transformed him. He then took the piece of paper with the story and carefully sewed it into the inside of his jacket, which he kept with him the rest of the life. It wasn't discovered until after his death. He never told anyone. Unlike his first intellectual conversion, this conversion was of the heart, and it struck. It stuck. He mostly gave up his work in mathematics, devoted himself to theology and apologetics. A few years later, he published Provincial Letters, an attack on moral casuistry, which is a clever but unsound reasoning to, to moral questions or fudging things. So he was done with learning. He was done with the, all, the, all the guys that were saying, this is what God is. And he said, I had a, he had a vision. He probably had a vision like Isaiah. He became one of the great church fathers. Listen, it's an amazing thing. When our lips are touched with a live coal from the altar of God, fire, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We're not only cleansed from our sins, but we're set aflame to fulfill Paul's word in Romans. Look what Paul says. He says, fire, saying just one word, fire, God of Abraham, God of, oh, excuse me, this is what uh, Blaise Pascal said. This is what he's noted for, fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers or the scholars, I will not forget your word. Amen. Blaise Pascal also said this, there are two types of men, those who are afraid to lose God and those who are afraid that they might find him. He found him. People are afraid. They'll change them. They'll change their lives totally if you find God. How many are with me tonight? All right, let me go a little further. Lastly, and that's not lastly, the fourth thing. Well, let me, before I get there, Paul said this to the Romans. Never flag and zeal. Be a glow, fired up with the Spirit, serve the Lord. It's not about being a nominal Christian. It's not about just going to church. 
It's about being fired up. It's about being a fanatic, a fan of Christ. That doesn't mean you go around pump, uh, bopping people over the head with your Bible. It means internally you have something driving you that's way beyond anything anybody else has in the world. So we see the next part. Commissioned to faithfulness. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said, I, here am I, send me. And he said, Go tell his people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, perceive not, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes. Let they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. It's an interesting statement. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitants, the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there is be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be, uh, shall be eaten as, a, tel as a, a teal tree, and as an oak, whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, so that the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Let me explain all of that for you. Unfortunately, many sermons in Isaiah chapter 6 end with, Here am I, send me. And they never tell you anything else. That's not the end of this. Sure, there's power in those words. It's like, hey, join the Navy and see the world. It's a commission, or it's like Uncle Sam wants you, or U.S. Marine slogan, we're looking for a few good men. That's what it is, here am I, send me. And there's no many messages that have been preached on that, but there's so much more. Stopping too soon, we miss the final meaning of the truth of fire. It's, one, it's more than re a recruiting slogan. God said to Isaiah, go tell his people the truth that will cause them to watch, stop their ears, close their eyes, and harden their hearts. He said, you tell them the truth, so that they will be able to close their eyes, stop their ears, and harden their hearts. In other words, tell them, and, that, and they will continue to ignore my, warning, my warnings. Man, if this isn't something for America today and the world, I don't know what is. Isaiah quite literally cries out, Lord, how long, in verse 11? And God answers him. He says this, Until my land is devastated, until my people are in exile. Notice the, the pronouns, my. Until my remnant is disciplined, until only a holy seed remains in the stump of the once mighty oak. He says, I want you to do this until everything is gone. I want you to preach the word until everything is gone. This last verse, verse 13, really gets me. But yet in it shall I be a tenth, and it shall return and shall be eaten as a tail tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. God is telling him, Isaiah, I'm going to leave a remnant. I'm going to take away everyone that doesn't even see me, everyone that doesn't hear me, and I'm going to leave a remnant. That's what God's whole purpose is. God will take away an entire generation and leave a remnant. He wants people that are pure and holy. So Paul says, be he holy as he is holy. Is, there, is this not true today for Israel? Well, let me just tell you. In the Living Bible, it says it this way. Yet a tenth, the remnant will survive, and through Israel, though the Israel is invaded again and again and destroyed, Israel will be like a tree cut down whose stump still lives and grows again. Does that happen? Does that happen in Israel? Israel's been invaded so many times, not even funny. In your lifetime, some of your lifetimes, look how many times they've been invaded. The War of Independence. I want to read you some of these things. God's making a promise to them. You will be invaded. I will take people away, but I will leave a remnant. I will leave my people. This is the War of Independence. 4,000 Israeli casualties, 2,000 civilians, 12,000 to, to 20,000 Palestinians. Notice the death tolls, how they're unequal. Then you have 1956-57, the Sinai-Suez campaign. Israel, 231 dead. Egypt, 1,650. Uh, Britain advanced, 10 and 16. Then the Six-Day War of 1967, Israel 770, Egypt 15,000, Jordan 6,000, Syria 1,000. 1967-1970, the War of Attrition, Israel 600 to 1,400, Egypt 2,800. The Neon Kippur War, you notice how it's unbalanced? How more, more people that are going against them are dying? The Yom Kippur War, Israel, 2,600. Between Egypt and Syria, over 11,000. Uh, we have Operation uh, Litani, Lebanon. Israel, 18. Lebanese and Palestinians, 1,200. First Lebanese War, 670 Israelis. This is in 1982. 17,800 Arabs were killed. April 1996, the Great Wrath in Lebanon. Hezbollah and Lebanese, 175 killed, no Israelis killed. July and August, Second Lebanese War, Israelis, 160. Lebanese, 1,200 civilians, 118 soldiers. De December 8th, January 9th, Operation Cast Lead. Israelis, 16 dead. The Palestinians, 1440, 940, 20 civilians. November 2012, Operation Pillar of Defense. Israeli, six killed, Palestinians, 177. God told them, I, you will be attacked over and over and over again, but you are, you're like a stump of an oak tree. You're going to keep growing back. You're going to keep coming up. Nothing can destroy Israel. There is no one on the planet that can destroy Israel because you'd be destroying God's word. He said they will always survive. And we have seen it just in your lifetime, some of our lifetimes, we have seen that. So what is our message for us tonight? We we are all sinners. Somebody say, I'm a sinner. 
The world is culpable for its sins. They have to be answered. God will warn before he judges. He always will. But he will have mercy and remember his people and the remnant who still trust him. This is your hope tonight and mine. So let me prophesy to you tonight. The Dow is at 25,770 as of today. It will not stay there. It will crash. Uh, China and U.S. are locked in a trade war. It will affect every single American. Christianity is under fire in the United States and it's going to get worse. Church attendance in the U.S. is an all-time low and it's going to get even lower. Israel lives under a constant threat of war and they will enter another one soon. Sin is at an all-time high everywhere. It will increase totally in measure. But here's the hope of Isaiah. And here's what he brings us. You and I are the remnant of God. And as such, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. He has mercy for us. The world is in a bad shape. How many know the world's in a bad shape? It is in a terrible shape. But God always protects the remnant. How many of you know you're the remnant? Because you're, call, you're calling on him. You're, you're wanting that vision of him. My last thing I want to tell you tonight is this. The great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, his love for us does not. He is not wearied by our sins or our indifferences, and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured of those sins at whatever cost to us and whatever cost to him. That's what C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity. You know, tonight I have hope. Tonight, one of the things in studying this that really hit me is that I love God. I know you love God. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. I try to live my life every day for Him. But I want to get so much more out of Him. I want to see Him so much more than I see the everyday things in my life. I mean, we're forced to see our everyday things. We're forced to see our workplace. We're forced to see the people that were at work, the bills, the this, the that. But there's so much more to life than that. Somebody say amen. So tonight I want to pray for you. And what I want to pray is for, is, is for a fresh vision. Not that we're, we're evil. We, we are sinners. We know that. But you and I are the remnant. We love God. But man, we can all have a greater vision of him. Somebody say amen. That vision, by the way, is going to get you closer to him. And when it gets you closer to him, you're going to realize how much more you have to do in your life. So let's just pray. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you, Lord, that in the, in the uh, solemn time of Isaiah, he saw you high and lifted up in your robe, filled the temple, Lord God. Lord, what a vision we need. I know that, that many men have seen that same vision, Lord God. I remember seeing it when I was saved, Lord God. I remember seeing how powerful you were and how high and lifted up you were and how you were sovereign and you were holy. And Lord, every day of my life, that's what I want to see. I want to continue to see you above everything that happens in my life. Let me see life through you, Lord, through that vision. Lord, and as I see you through that vision, humility will grow in me, Lord God, and I will realize that I am unclean, but you... The coals of the altar will make me clean, Lord God. You will use my lips, Lord, to, to teach others, Lord God. I just pray for everyone here tonight, Lord God, that our vision becomes acute, that it becomes focused, Lord God. I pray for us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.